Welcome back. I'm Muggsy, and today I'm going to explain atoms. Thousands of years ago, Greek philosophers like Democritus had this idea that if you broke a pure substance apart, such as a copper rod, and you kept breaking it in half, you must get to some point where you can't break it apart anymore. And that must represent one indivisible particle of copper that you can't get any smaller and it would still be copper. And they, they call this idea an atomos, which we've shortened to an atom. So an atom is the smallest unit of an element that you can create and have it still be that element. Now atoms, uh, while indivisible themselves, are, are also made of smaller particles. We call these subatomic particles because they're smaller than atoms. And in fact, those subatomic particles are made of smaller particles, but we're not going to concern ourselves with those because you don't really need to know about them for a general chemistry course. That's more of an advanced chemistry and physics idea. But those three basic subatomic particles that make up an atom are protons, neutrons, and electrons. Of these three, protons are actually the easiest to remember because protons have a positive charge. In the sense that if I was pro-tacos, that means I have a positive opinion of tacos, which of course I do. Uh, neutrons are also kind of easy to remember. They have no charge at all because they're neutral. They're neither positive nor negative. They're neutral. Neutron, neutral. And I guess by process of elimination, you could say electrons have a negative charge. Now, these charges are like magnetic charges. Just you can think of like charges as repelling and opposite charges as attracting. Uh, and then neutral charges not really having any effect at all. Okay, now what do I mean when I say that an atom is made of these subatomic particles? Is an atom just a big mix of protons, neutrons, and electrons? Well, no. As it turns out, it's much more organized than that. So these protons and neutrons exist in kind of a cluster at the middle of the atom. And we call this the nucleus. Now an atomic nucleus is kind of like a cell nucleus. It's at the middle of the cell. Uh, just like the atomic nucleus is at the middle of the atom. So the rest of the atom is kind of empty space, and in that empty space we have these little electrons kind of whizzing around in orbits. There's one orbit, there's a further orbit out, that kind of thing. And so uh, this is a very simplified version of what an atom might look like. In reality it's much more complicated, it involves quantum mechanics and special weird looking orbitals. But this version, this is called the Bohr model of the atom, I think is the best for kind of understanding uh, the atom on a basic level for a general chemistry course. And when I think of an atom in this sense, I can kind of think of a solar system. The nucleus is kind of like the sun at the center of the solar system, and the electrons are kind of like the planets and moons orbiting the sun, orbiting around the uh, nucleus. Now this analogy actually holds true in many ways in the sense that the nucleus, like the sun, contains almost all of the mass of the atom, like 99.99% of the mass of the atom is contained here in the nucleus. The rest of it, the electrons, have hardly any mass at all. Just like the sun contains like 99.99% of the mass of the solar system, and the planets, even big ones like Jupiter, contain very little mass compared to the sun. Another way this analogy holds true is the sun in our solar system accounts for very little of the volume of the solar system. Even though it's incredibly massive, heavy, it doesn't take up a lot of space. And so um, it's very similar to the atomic nucleus, which is actually really, really tiny. And then the electrons orbit it way far out. You can think of basically an atom being like a, a football stadium. And in the center of that stadium, there's a blueberry right on the 50 yard line. That blueberry is the nucleus. And then the rest of the stadium is just space for the electrons to orbit. So this Bohr model kind of represents what an atom actually looks like. It's a nucleus made of protons and neutrons in the center, and then these electrons orbiting much further out. 
Now, if these protons all have positive charges, you might ask, well, how can they exist in a big clump together? And that's because of something called the strong nuclear force, which actually holds the nucleus together even though these protons have positive charges. This is one of the fundamental forces of nature and is much stronger than other forces of nature like gravity, which is considered very weak uh, compared to the strong nuclear force. Okay. Let's talk about different versions of atoms now. Let's look at the simplest possible atom we can imagine. In the nucleus, we would just have one proton, and orbiting that nucleus, we would just have one electron. Uh, in fact, this represents an element. This re represents the element hydrogen, the first element in the periodic table and the smallest element there is. If we had two protons in the nucleus, well, there would also be two neutrons. And then orbiting that, there would be two electrons. And this represents the second smallest in the periodic table, helium. And I think you can kind of see the trend here. As we increase the number of protons, we tend to also increase the number of neutrons and electrons, and the elements get bigger and bigger and bigger. So for instance, the third element in the periodic table, lithium, contains three protons in the nucleus, typically four neutrons, and that typically we'll talk about later, and then it contains three electrons, two orbiting it, the nucleus in the first energy level, and one orbiting the nucleus in the second energy level. And now we're starting to see that as the elements get bigger and bigger, there's more and more um, electrons orbiting that nucleus, just like, um, you know, uh, our solar system has lots of different planets orbiting the sun. Okay. So, uh, this element, by the way, is the element lithium. It's the third smallest element in the periodic table. And we're starting to see something here, in that um, as the elements get more and more protons, they also get more neutrons, they get more and more electrons, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so hydrogen and helium are both really light gases. They're lighter than air. And so they um, would float, even in air, they would float to the top. Lithium's a really light metal. And as we get bigger and bigger and bigger, we get up to things like gold that have many, many protons and many, many neutrons in their nucleus and make for a very, very heavy atom. Lead is another good example of this. So it's the number of protons that make up how big an atom is. And all these different flavors of atoms with different number of protons, we call those elements. And those make up the periodic table of the elements. Currently, as you can see, there are about 118 elements. Although many of these actually don't occur in nature, they've only been made in particle colliders, and some of them only exist for a fraction of a second. But a lot of these, you can see, do exist in nature, and they're part of the substances that make up your body and everything around you in the world. Some of them, like hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, iron, silicon, are very common here on Earth. We talked about the smallest unit of a pure substance being an atom, so there, that must mean that if we take water and break it down to its smallest piece, that must be a water atom. But this is actually a misconception. Sometimes things that seem to us like pure substances, like water or air, are actually compounds or even mixes of compounds. And so with chemical processes, we can break things down to their absolute smallest unit, and you may have learned in a previous class that water is just H2O. That means it's two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. I have a video on chemical formulas. We'll go over those later. But for now, you just need to know that a lot of substances out there in the world around us, such as oxygen, water, uh, rust, all kinds of things, sugar, uh, are mixes of um, elements together. And when ele elements are combined chemically, we call them compounds. A compound is just a bigger, more complicated thing made from multiple elements stuck together. Um, and so salt, for example, one sodium atom and one chlorine atom stuck together is a, another example of a compound.
There's one more thing that I want to talk to you about before we review atoms, and that is isotopes. Now, as I stated earlier, a hydrogen atom is just a proton with an electron orbiting it. But every now and then, there might be a proton and a neutron with an electron orbiting it. Now, you may recall that what I said earlier is it's the number of protons that determine an element. It's not the number of neutrons. So this top structure, one proton and one electron, is hydrogen, because it has one proton. And this bottom thing, with one proton and one neutron, and one electron, is also hydrogen. <laughs> There's also one proton, one, two neutrons, with an electron orbiting it, and we call this hydrogen. <laughs> So these are all hydrogen. Sometimes elements have different numbers of neutrons. This one has zero neutrons, this one has one neutron, and this one has two neutrons, but they're all hydrogen atoms. So how can we tell them apart? Well, we call these isotopes. And isotopes are just versions of an element with different numbers of neutrons. Now, neutrons, because they don't have a positive charge or a negative charge, they're neutral, have no effect really on the chemical properties of that atom. So hydrogen with zero neutrons will bond with oxygen to form water. Hydrogen with one neutron will do the exact same thing. It'll bind together with oxygen to form water. Hydrogen with two neutrons will do the exact same thing. It'll bond together with oxygen to form water. So all of these basically chemically behave the same. What is different about them is that these neutrons do have mass, they are heavy, and so this uh, hydrogen with one neutron, we call this deuterium, is slightly heavier than normal basic hydrogen, and this hydrogen with two neutrons, we call it tritium, is heavier than the deuterium and the normal hydrogen. So there are kind of physical property differences between these different isotopes, but they basically behave chemically the same. So just remember that um, it's the number of protons that make an element an element, but the number of neutrons can change, and these different versions are called isotopes. Okay, what if, for example, I had uh, two protons and uh, a neutron in the nucleus? What's going on there? Well, as I said earlier, it's the number of protons that determine the identity of an element. So everything with two protons is no longer hydrogen, it's now helium, the second smallest element in the periodic table. And helium, because it has these two protons, it would attract two electrons to orbit those protons in the first energy level. And I guess here we're kind of seeing an important a relationship as well, the number of protons and electrons are always the same. So hydrogen has one proton, therefore it has one electron. Helium has two protons, therefore it has two electrons. The number of neutrons aren't really involved. They just have to do with the overall mass of the atom. But usually the number of neutrons is equal to the number of protons, but not always. We see lots of examples here where that's not the case. So we can combine everything that I just told you about atoms into one basic uh, theory, and we call this the atomic theory. Now remember, a theory in science is basically an ironclad <laughs> description of what we know about the world. It represents the best evidence over hundreds, in some cases thousands of years, about what we know. It's very different from saying, I have a theory that they're going to serve tacos in the lunchroom today. That's not a theory, that's just a guess. But people use theory that way in normal conversation uh, because maybe they don't know how it's used in sciences or maybe they just have a separate way of using it in normal conversation than they would in science class or in a laboratory. But the atomic theory is this idea that all matter out there in the universe is made of atoms. And those atoms, as we discussed earlier, are indivisible. They can't be broken apart into smaller things. If they are, it's um, through kind of nuclear processes that we'll learn about later, and those still don't violate the laws of thermodynamics. So there's a little bit of a caveat there, but whatever. Um, 
The other thing we would say is that atoms come in different varieties. There are about 118 of these different varieties, and we call these varieties elements, which are determined by different numbers of protons in their nucleus. Atoms have a nucleus made of protons and neutrons that's very, very dense. It's very, very massive, but also very, very small. And most of the atom is empty space taken up by electrons, which orbit that nucleus in distinct orbitals. Finally, we would say that atoms can be combined in whole number ratios, because you can't have less than one atom, to make the compounds and molecules that make up the world around us. Just as you might take a sodium atom, a chlorine atom, stick them together and get salt, sodium chloride. You might take two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen atom, stick them together to make water. We call these things chemical compounds. The only other thing on top of all this stuff about atoms is I would remember that isotopes are different versions of an element. So different versions of hydrogen, different versions of nitrogen, different versions of iron, any element that are basically the same. They're chemically the same. They have the same number of protons and electrons, but they have different numbers of neutrons. So there you go. That's the basic atomic theory. It's not a whole lot for, to get you started, but this basic information is kind of everything you need to know to build on your chemistry course from here. It's usually something I teach my students in, let's say, the first week of class, or sometimes I'll, I'll use the first few weeks of class to go over skills that aren't even related to chemistry, like how to set up an experiment and how to do some basic math. But once I get into actual chemistry, it's the first thing I'll teach, and then we'll build on your knowledge from there. So um, yeah, I've got lots of other videos from this point on. You can continue with your chemistry education. I wish you well, take care.